Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Brenham Presbyterian Church on this Father's Day Sunday. And if you're a visitor here or a member here, we're glad you're with us this morning of worshiping on YouTube. There's a lot going on in the life of the church. We'll get to that a little bit later. Please join me in the responsive call to worship you'll find in your bulletin. You either send a bulletin by the email link or you can click on the link on the YouTube and you can download the bulletin if you would like. Again, join me in the call to worship. A gift of a new day, unlived, untried, ready to be opened. A new day with surprising miracles, with love, be given, kindness to be shared, and peace to be enjoyed, a gift of a new day, God's gift to us. Let us receive it with joy and live in its expectation. Let us worship in praise and gratitude. Amen. I invite you this morning to listen to our opening hymn. It is Faith of Our Fathers with Betsy Newman on the flute. generous God, your gifts are overwhelming. Your sun lights the way for our journey and your stars puncture our darkness. Wondrous and generous God, from the four corners of the earth, a chorus of praise erupts. The ocean roars and the trees shout their joy. From the deepest depths of our being, our prayer gropes to find words of adoration. Come now, wondrous and generous God, Make this church a place where seeds grow, joy is shared, songs are sung, peace is shaped, dreams are born, sorrow is graced, and ripples of love spread. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us therefore confess our sin before God and one another, 
First using the unison prayer of confession you will find in your bulletin this morning. Let us pray together. Faithful God, persistent friend, you weave so many wonderful people into our lives, fathers and mothers, children and youth, friends and neighbors, teachers and preachers. Yet do we stop to acknowledge them as blessings from God? Do we say a word of thanks or whisper a prayer of gratitude? Have we told our appreciation, written a word of encouragement, sung their praises? Faithful God, forgive us for taking anyone for granted. Give us eyes to see the miracles around us. Give us hearts that know you care for each and every one. Give us voices to sing our thanks. Amen. Let us continue with silent prayers of confession. Let us pray. Our hope is in Christ. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our heart shine only with your light, speak only with your truth. May all of us today, by the power of your Spirit, hear what you would have us hear. We ask this in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Several pieces of Scripture this morning, beginning with Psalm 107, a partial reading of the psalm. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went down to the seas in ships doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits' ends. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet. And he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Two readings from the Gospel of Mark this morning from chapter 4. The first one is this. Jesus also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The story goes on. When evening had come, he said to them, his disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? From Paul's letter to the church in Colossians, Colossians 3, 15 through 17, Paul writes, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. 
whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And finally, one line from the book of Jeremiah. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in, it, it's, in its welfare you will find your welfare. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, for those of you tuning in by YouTube, you should know that this will be the second Sunday that we are back in the sanctuary. We started last week. We had a good turnout. I want to reiterate that we will continue these YouTube worship services. If you're watching this, you were very important to us. And so I just want you to know that. But at the same time, we were all delighted to be back in physical worship again in our sanctuary. I know I was. I was delighted. It was great to hear the organ and the choir. It was great to see faces of people. It really was wonderful. But I have to be honest with you, it also felt a little bit surreal to me, or maybe even a little unreal. I always felt that as if any moment, maybe we'd be dragged back to where we were. A feeling of kind of being up and down, I think many of us are familiar with. Because we've just all been through a storm. It's called COVID-19 or the pandemic. And it did feel like a storm, didn't it? The numbers were up, the numbers were down. It felt safe to go out and then suddenly it wasn't. And the numbers went up and the numbers went down again and we were tossed to and fro like a ship at sea caught in a storm. In fact, using the words of the psalmist this morning, I think I can describe how we feel by changing just a few words. That we were raised up by the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. We mounted up to heaven and went down to the depths. Our courage melted away in our calamity. We reeled and staggered and we were at our wit's end. It's a pretty good description, isn't it, of how we felt during this storm we call the pandemic, COVID-19, for whatever else it was, it was for all of us a storm. Now I use the past tense here, was a storm, very hesitantly. Because we are fortunate that we are living right now in a calm after the storm. Because we, in this country here, have access to vaccines. They are available. And we are in a calm. But my friends, that calm is neither absolute, nor is it worldwide. In the United States of America, with a population of 328 million people, only 41% of the population is fully vaccinated. That's less than half. And that's where the vaccine is readily available. And the rest of the world isn't faring any better, and they often don't have a choice about whether they can get the vaccine or not. Think about India. A country of 1.38 billion people, and only 3.4% of them have been vaccinated. You can say, well, that's just an underdeveloped country. Think about Japan, one of the most advanced industrialized countries in the world, a population of 127 million people, and only 4.8% of them have been fully vaccinated, and they're about to hold an Olympics. This calm is neither absolute nor worldwide. And from the point of view of the human race, looked at globally, we're still in the midst of a storm. Yet at this moment, right now, in our context, in the here and now, we are blessed to be in a calm after the storm. And you know, God used various human beings to bring all of us to this moment. And in the larger picture, think about all the scientists that worked um, just feverishly to bring us quickly, not one, but three vaccines. Think about the army of people that were mobilized coast to coast to get shots into arms. I don't know where you might have gotten your vaccine. I got mine here in Brenham. And it was set up just wonderfully to get as many people vaccinated, but there were people that were mobilized to do that. Think about the stalkers all through this pandemic 
who worked to make sure that our grocery store shelves were full of the things that we needed. Think about the health care workers. All of these stood in the midst of the storm we call the pandemic, and they were buffeted by its wind. They worked tirelessly for the welfare of the city or the communities in which they lived, whatever city that happens to be. They worked tirelessly for the welfare of the city or the community. And in doing so, in, in many ways, they were living out a biblical command we heard this morning. In the book of Jeremiah, God commands this of the chosen people, of the Hebrew people who have just lived through the storm of being deported from their own lands into Babylon. And through Jeremiah, God says this, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for it is in its welfare you will find your welfare. But seek the welfare of the city. And so they did then and now. So many people now sought the welfare of the city even before they sought their own welfare. And what is the proper response to the people who have brought us to this moment today? Those who sought the welfare of others before their own. What is the proper response to them? That's a good question, I think. And I've heard some really bad answers to that question. One such answer is locked up in a thing called exceptionalism. The point of view that somehow we in this country are more deserving of the vaccine because after all, they were developed here. It was our money. We work hard and we're industrious, some say, so we're more deserving than others. And the people that work so hard, I just mentioned, well, they're just employees. They do what they're told. They, after all, get a paycheck. And I've heard at least one comment that says they were just lucky to have a job in the time of the pandemic. They should be grateful for that job. Really? From the lowliest stocking clerk to that overwhelmed nurse to that epidemiologist or other physician who dared speak the truth about the pandemic and were reviled for it, isn't it not us that owe them and others a debt of gratitude? Do we not owe them a debt of gratitude? For without their work, none of us would be here today in our sanctuary celebrating and praising God. You know, gratitude is incredibly important. As a matter of fact, gratitude is a key to civilization. It is a cornerstone, a bedrock of civilized living. And that's true historically. That whole notion of seek the welfare of the city and the gratitude to those who do so has an ancient and wide history. We heard the reading from Jeremiah, probably one of the most ancient references that's probably dates from the 7th century BC, seek the welfare of the city. We know from Greek cities from the 5th century BC, we dug up uh, plaques that actually honored what were called benefactors of the city. Those weren't just people who gave money. Those were people who stood up in a time of storm or crisis and put their welfare ahead, I'm sorry, put their welfare behind the needs of the city. There was gratitude there. Even the Romans picked up on this. This very phrase, seek the welfare of the city, was used in the first century A.D. by an official under the emperor of Claudius. It shows up again in the second century A.D. in a pronouncer from the proconsul of the city of Ephesus. The point here is, is that in the ancient civilized world, failure to show gratitude to such benefactors who acted in time of crises, to fail to do that was considered an outrage, even a sin. Even a sin. Gratitude to those who work to seek the welfare of the community, especially during a time of storm or crisis, has a long and ancient history and is a key component to civilized living, even and especially in a time of storms. 
You know, we hear the phrase, the calm before the storm. But really, if you think about it, the inverse is more often true. We're often faced with the storm before the calm, and that storm very often comes up suddenly and without warning. Think about the pandemic. It started as a whisper, a rumor on the other side of the world, and suddenly we woke up and it was here. It came on us almost all at once, it felt like. And pandemics aren't the only storms that come up in our lives. All of us that have a storm come up in one way or another that we didn't expect that was here all of a sudden. That job we suddenly lost, that relationship that dissolved, that child that went off the rails, whatever it is in your life. Storms come up suddenly. They blow up suddenly in our lives and we feel like those ancient seamen tossed up and down and to and fro in the psalm that I read this morning. Or maybe we feel a bit like the disciples. In the reading from Mark, they cry out to Jesus, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do we not sometimes cry out, God, do you not care that we are perishing? And we just want Jesus to stand up in the boats of our lives and say, Peace, be still, and have the storm stop cold. There be a calm. And when that happens, and it does happen, what finally is our response? When that calm comes in the storms, whether it's the pandemic or other storms in our life, what is our response? That's a good question, too. Because, you know, some people, some want to just focus on the storm. They can't let go of it. They want to blame someone, anyone, those people over there, that person over there. Or they just want to blame God. God, where were you in the midst of all this? God, why won't you solve this? God, they want to blame God. And my friends, let me assure you of something. God did not send this pandemic. This is not some kind of divine punishment. Storms come up in our lives. Some of them are of our own making. Some of them are not. But they come up, and they're not punishment. And they do pass. But when they do, some in our world, all they can do is still look for someone to blame. But others, others face the storm. And they're grateful to God when the calm comes and perhaps grateful that they too had a hand in that. A grocery clerk I know about here in Brenham who, when it first came up, worked overtime on her own time to stock the last shipment of hand sanitizer at HEB. Or those people who brought our groceries out, mostly younger people. And many of them took it seriously. One's a member of our own church. They were glad to be involved with keeping people safe. Some see the face of God in that burned out nurse who's seen just one too many storm during her work day. Here in America, in India, in Japan, across the globe. Those who work for the will of God. And some of them don't believe in the same God we do. Some don't believe in God at all. That doesn't matter. God will use whom God will use to bring about a calm. Unexpected people bring about a calm. Think about this. God worked through a lowly carpenter's son who stood in a boat and said, Peace, be still, and a storm was still. Who would have thought it? And that same man, that son of the living God, challenges us this morning. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? But you know what? Faith demands action. We are called as people of faith, to act with care, with resources, and yes, with gratitude. With gratitude. It can be hard to do sometimes. A great Christian missionary, Albert Schweitzer, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, the great physician who was no stranger to epidemics and no stranger to the storm of disease, once made this comment. He said, at times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep 
gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. At times our own light goes out and it is rekindled by a spark from another person perhaps looked forward, look, look, not looked for. And maybe God sent that person into our lives. I believe that's true even and especially in times of storm. When we face the storm before the calm. And when the calm follows, you know, even the smallest mustard seed of gratitude can grow into something amazingly large. When I was in seminary over 20 years ago, there was a favorite watering hole. I went to a seminary at Austin, Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Austin, and our favorite watering hole was a place, I think it's still there, called Trudy's. Trudy's has great Mexican food and great margaritas, and particularly after grueling exams, midterms, or finals, it was not uncommon for a large group of seminary students to go over there to eat and to celebrate being done. So it was after a particularly difficult set of midterms, a group of about 30 of us descended as one party on Trudy's, and they sat us all together. They pushed tables like a giant banquet, right? Problem was, they were running short of help that night, and we had one waitress. And she was not only tending to us, she had a couple other stations she was minding as well. And we were in no hurry. We had plenty of time. And so it was, as the night ran on, we ran up quite a tab together. And we looked at this one poor waitress and we decided not to have the tab split up. Rather than asking her to do that, we took a, a kind of a basket somebody had and everybody looked at the check and put in their portion and then what they thought should be a tip. And it went all the way down the table. And unfortunately, I was the last one to have the basket. And because I was an ex-banker, I got stuck with the task of settling the tab. That was fun. And by ones and twos and threes, people began to drift out laughing and relaxed. And I remember I was involved in some conversation about some theological issue with a colleague and a friend. And so the night ended. The next morning when I got up, put my pants on to go to get breakfast, I felt a lump in my pocket, and I reached in and pulled out, and to my horror, there was a whole wad of cash and the check. I had I'd walked out and not paid the bill. I felt horrible. And even though it was in the morning, I quickly got dressed and then walked over to Trudy's. They weren't open yet, but I could see employees. I knock on the door, and after a number of, we're not open yet, the manager finally came to the door. He said, can I help you? I showed him the cash, and I showed him the check. He said, that's a lot of money. Come on in. And he locked the door. So he took the check, and he added it all up, noted the tip, and he said, thank you. And I said, I don't think that's enough, man. I said, I, I really owe that waitress an apology, because I've worked in restaurants, and I, I really would like to apologize. Can you tell me when I might be able to find her? He looked at the check. He said, you're in luck. She's on the, she's on the day shift today. I'll go get her. So he goes in the back, and he brings her out. She recognized me. And I apologized profusely for what had happened. And she said, well, I thought you guys had stiffed me because the service was slow, because it was slow. First off, I'm kind of new here. And second of all, there was just a storm of people here. And I said, no, we didn't. It was just a mistake. I just accidentally walked out. And she said, oh, I really thought it was because I'd given bad service. I said, ma'am, you didn't get bad service. We were just grateful that you could wait on us. It had been a long week, and we were just grateful. She said, okay. I said, I can see you don't quite believe me. Well, I added this up, and i got to tell you something. And I want you to remember, folks, this was 20 years ago. This was a $700 tab, and it was a 25% tip when you added it all up. She did the math, and she said, you're kidding me. And I said, no, I'm not. There it is. You did a good job. Don't worry about it. She said, are you a UT student? I said, no, I'm not. I, I'm, I go to the seminary. She says, oh, the seminary. And then she said, I never had much use for religion and even less use for God. And then she stopped as if she might have said something wrong. I said, don't worry about it. A lot of people feel that way. But just know, you really did do a good job. And, you know, thank you. And she said, you want to be a minister? I said, yes, I do. And all those people that were sitting there, they want to be ministers? I said, yes. She said, I got one more question for you. Do you go to church here in Austin? 
I said, yes, ma'am. She took a piece of paper and a pencil. She said, what's the name of that church? And she wrote it down. My friends, there will be storms before the calm. But in the calm, even the smallest seed of gratitude can grow into the first steps of faith. And in that calm that follows the storm, who knows? It might even change lives. May God bless you all. Amen. May the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Let's take a moment of silent reflection upon the word proclaimed. Amen. Let us say what we believe using the ancient baptismal formula known as the Apostles' Creed. You'll find it in your worship bulletin this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please join me in our prayers of intercession and petition. This morning, a special prayer for the fathers in our lives. Let us pray. We give our thanks, Creator God, for the fathers in our lives. Fatherhood does not come with a manual. And reality teaches us that some fathers excel while others fail. We ask for your blessings for them all and forgiveness where it is needed. This Father's Day, we remember the many sacrifices that fathers made for their children and families, and in the ways, both big and small, they lift children to achieve dreams fought beyond reach. So too, we remember all of those who have helped fill the void when fathers pass early or are absent, grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors and coaches, and the women of our family. For those who are fathers, we ask for wisdom and humility in the face of the task of parenting. Give them strength to do well by their children and by you. In your holy name, O oh God, we pray. Amen. Now we are bold to pray the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. There remains a lot going on in the life of this church. The Galilee Garden continues to grow. I had my numbers corrected in a committee meeting the other day. Um, we have grown um, over 5,000 pounds of vegetables or donated 5,000 to those in need. That's a lot of vegetables, folks. We continue to support all kinds of ministries. This worship service on YouTube and physical worship is part of our mission and ministry. Our services are open to all. Perhaps you could think of sharing some of your financial resources with us to help support our mission and ministries. You could do so by check, by sending to Brenham Presbyterian Church, 1005 Green Street, Brenham, Texas, 77833. That goes to a secure lockbox here at the church. We are a nonprofit. We do keep records. We're happy to send a receipt at the end of the year. Or maybe you'd like to go to the website and there's a secure giving link. 
brenhampresbyterian.org backslash give. Any gift, no matter what size, is welcome and helpful. However, if for some reason you have financial difficulty or the potential of financial difficulty in your life, we would never ask anyone to give to this church before their own welfare. And if you find yourself at this point not in a position to be able to share your financial resources, that's fine. We would only ask that you pray for us then. In those circumstances, pray for the mission and the ministries of Brenham Presbyterian, for the pastoral staff, the session of elders, the music ministry. Pray for the, the visitors, both online and elsewhere. Just pray for Brenham Presbyterian. Prayers are always welcome. For the charge this morning, I want you to hear again these words of the Apostle Paul. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of quiet Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your heart. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let us join together in our closing hymn number eight in the hymnal, but the words are in the bulletin. Eternal Father, strong to say, may God bless you all. peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, sisters and brothers in Christ. Go in peace. Amen.